Family Mode. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network. I'm filling in today for Lauren Wenzel, um, and this webinar is part of the NOAA National MPA Center's uh, monthly webinar series, and we're very glad you could be with us today. Um, Co-hosts for this webinar are my organization, the EBM Tools Network, as well as uh, MPA News uh, and OpenChannels.org, and we have a representative from uh, OpenChannels.org with us also as, as co-moderator, Nick Weiner. Um, so welcome today. Today's webinar is going to be uh, by Sarah Fangman, for, superintendent of the Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary, and she's going to be speaking about demonstrating relevance, applying lessons on management e effectiveness from the Grays Reefs Sanctuary. Um, to give you a little of information about Sarah, uh, since Sarah, since 20, August 2014, uh, has served as the superintendent of Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, as head of Grays Reef, she oversees management and operations of the 22-square-mile protected area, which is located 16 miles off the coach, coast of Sapelo Island, Georgia. Uh, she's been with the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries since 1998. She arrived in Savannah in 2005 to serve as the program coordinator for the organization's Southeast, Gulf of Mexico, and Caribbean region. Um, prior to moving east, she was the science coordinator for the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and based in Santa Barbara, California. She has a Master's of Science in Marine Affairs from the University of Washington in Seattle. And while she was working on her master's degree, she was an intern for NOAA and then uh, became a NOAA Presidential Management Fellow. She is also a NOAA Advanced Working Diver. Um, she and her husband live in Savannah, and her favorite hobbies are traveling, diving, bird watching, and skiing and snowboarding with family and friends, which she probably wishes she were doing right now. <laughs> uh, all right, so Sarah, welcome. And before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. So Sarah's going to be presenting first, but we have a dedicated time for question and answer afterwards. Um, and you ask a question, there's a little question panel in your user interface, type in the questions, and I will be relaying them to Sarah as, as moderator. Um, feel free to send the questions in at any point during the presentation. Um, quick clarifying questions, I may ask her during the presentation, but we'll save the more substantive stuff for the end, uh, but feel free to send in the questions at any point. Okay, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. So I'll we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I too want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in to this presentation today. Um, I suspect that a discussion of demonstrating relevance and evaluating effectiveness is probably not what got you out of bed this morning, um, uh, but I hope you'll see why I think at the end of this talk that we do really need to put some time and energy into examining our relevance and looking at how effective we are at what we really care about, which is helping to protect and conserve our special marine places. So I am going to talk about process, uh, something we undertook at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary to try to refine our programs and become more focused and more effective at what we're trying to do. I'm going to describe our experience in evaluating our relevance uh, with the goal of offering some information about how we approach this effort and why we went about it the way that we did. And I want to offer some reflections on what worked for us and what didn't. My hope being that each of you may find something in what I discuss that might be relevant and thought-provoking to you. So with that, I want to give you a little bit of context about Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. So this is an MPA off the coast of Savannah, Georgia, um, in the southeast US. It is a 35-year-old MPA. It's remote, so if you were to go there, this is what you'd see. You'd see a lot of water. Um, but obviously what makes it special lies beneath the water. And so I'm going to have some slides scrolling through while I give you more context that kind of shows you the pretty place that Gray's Reef is. So um, Gray's Reef is quite diverse, as you'll picture from all of these images. Um, and as you can see, that it's someplace that's nice to dive. Um, but very few people actually go there. There's no commercial fishing in Gray's Reef. 
Recreational fishing occurs in relatively small numbers um, aboard private small vessels. There are no regular charters that take people to Gray's Reef, either to fish or to dive, um, although it is a really beautiful place to dive. Um, as I said, it's, it's remote and, and little activity. Very few people actually even know that it exists. <clears throat> So early management of this uh, special MPA was really focused on understanding the sanctuary. And I believe that's appropriate given that its designation was driven by the fact that in the 1960s it was a focal point for characterization efforts. So management early on really focused on promoting science and monitoring in this MPA and using that information to identify threats. And so over the years, I think the sanctuary superintendents prior to me did a fabulous job of establishing additional regulations to protect this place, addressing the threats that were identified along the way. So for example, anchoring is prohibited in the sanctuary, spearfishing is prohibited in the entire sanctuary, and fully one-third of Gray's Reef is set aside as a research-only area. So in sum, it's a really well-protected and well-studied MPA, but few people know about it. The other thing that's really important to know, I think, in the context of this um, talk, is not only is the sanctuary relatively small, but we have a, a very small staff. There's just nine of us that work with Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. But you will not find a more passionate, creative, and hardworking group of people. This team is really committed to the mission of Gray's Reef and not just, well, let's just do this or that because that's what we've always done. This team really wants their time and energy to make a difference, which I believe is very important to our uh, evaluation efforts and um, a lot of the driver for what made our efforts successful in undertaking this evaluation. But I'll get back to that in a minute. So the sanctuary is managed uh, under a management plan the most recent management plan for Gray's Reef was published in August of, or July actually, of 2014. Um, management plans are documents that sanctuaries use to kind of present a roadmap for what we're going to do to manage and protect these special places over the course of a roughly five year timeline, sometimes a little longer. And different sanctuaries have developed management plans that follow different models. In the case of Gray's Reef, ours is really more like a strategic plan in that it really outlines the big picture of what we need to do. It talks about our vision, our mission, goals, and objectives, but it leaves out a lot of depth in terms of how we're going to do these things. For Gray's Reef, um, another thing that's unique, or not, maybe not unique, but, but notable in our management plan is that it has a heavy emphasis on evaluation. So woven throughout the plan is the call for us to evaluate what we're doing. Every program area and objective includes an element of evaluation. So not just what are we, we're going to, for example, implement a water quality protection program, but it also states that we need to assess how well that program is meeting its stated goals and objectives. So with that background, um, I want to start to talk about how we are trying to stay true to this emphasis on evaluation at Gray's Reef. So I'm going to start by talking about evaluating the relevance of our outreach and education programs. Again, the driver for this effort was our management plan. And through this process, what we wanted to do was be able to answer the questions, can our programs be more efficient, can they be more effective, and are there gaps? Before we can answer those questions, though, we really have to know what it is we're aiming to achieve, right? We need to know what success looks like. So we started by having a, a staff retreat. And we used that two-day session to bring everyone together and really wrap our minds around a, a list of what are our target resources, what are the threats that are, are addressing those resources, what behaviors relate to those threats, who are the audiences related to those, and then we articulated what we called our future states. So future states, what is that? I mentioned that our management plan lays out our vision, our mission, but those are really at a high level. 
So for example, our, our vision calls for us to continue to be an area teeming with diversity and abundance of marine life. Very lofty, very broad. So we decided we really needed it to, to know if we're being effective in our outreach and education and in all of our other programs. We need to get more specific relative to what we're trying to achieve. So we as a team created these um, future states. And you can see they come in five categories. And we really started to try to drill down. So not just it's going to be an area teeming with diversity, but for example, it's going to support a healthy soundscape that does not impact, negatively impact living resources, for example. So that really laid the groundwork so that we all own this. It's hard to know where you're going and evaluate your effectiveness if you don't you know, it, it, you can't evaluate effectiveness without this level of understanding of what you're trying to do. So we, we started by creating that. With that groundwork laid, we then um, began the evaluation process more formally. So we pulled together a working group of external partners. And so for us, this was not an internal exercise. This evaluation involved people who had been working with us in, in education and outreach for many, many years. We brought them together for two in-person sessions um, over this t time of about two months. We're together for about five months. I mean, five months, five days. It felt like five months. Um, anyway, as you can tell, it was a pretty significant investment in time and effort. And prior to that, in addition to the future state target resource articulation exercise that we undertook, there was a lot of work that went into planning how to work this group of experts or, or um, this team of evaluators through this process to get a positive result at the end. So it was a considerable amount of effort. <clears throat> so also before you can evaluate, you need to articulate what specifically you're, you're going to look at. What are you putting under the microscope? And so for us, this slide shows the list of things. Um, it's not everything that we do in outreach and education. We filtered it and said, OK, what programs are we going to look at? Well, let's look at the ones with, for which we invest a whole lot of time and effort. So not a one-off event that we go to you know, put up a booth and it's a Saturday afternoon for four hours. We're not going to evaluate to that degree. But these programs that you see listed here are things that we do that take a whole lot of ta staff time and effort. Let's put those under the microscope and ask ourselves if they're effective. And then we also wanted to look at how we use communication tools, so our website, print media, all these things that you see listed here. We put those under the microscope as well. Now, <clears throat> outreach and education is about reaching people. So it was important for us to also articulate who do we need to be talking to and engaging with to reach our future states. So for us, again, it's just a process step, but you really need to know who are we trying to reach. And then we can use that information to evaluate ourselves. <clears throat> so once we had all that groundwork laid, we brought these folks together <clears throat> to review each program and each communication tool. And so we would look at each program and ask ourselves, which audiences does this program reach? <clears throat> which threats does it relate to? And then which tools might be the right ones to reach that audience relative to which message? We also considered well, how much work, how much resources are required for that given program. And is there someone else who might be doing something similar? Because if we're putting a whole mess of time into something that somebody else is doing just like it, does it make sense for us to do that? And then the other major piece we asked ourselves was, are there gaps? Are there, are there resources with threats that education and outreach has a role to play in addressing? And if so, how might we fill them? Having gone through those three steps, we then did a prioritization exercise. So a moment ago, I mentioned we put a whole lot of time into planning for this. And this slide has a lot of teeny tiny words on it. And um, I don't expect you to be able to read them or need to read them. I'm merely trying to illustrate, for example, the kind of content that we prepared for this process. And what I will tell you about this slide is that what it attempts to do is help us draw a very direct line between the resources and the threats that we are trying to protect and address and, and the 
the key change and the future state that we're trying to reach. So on the left side, you see the resources and the threats. On the right side, trust me because I doubt you can read it, is key changes and future states that we're trying to achieve. And then you see a big blank space in the middle. And so our task during the evaluation was to look at which programs and re reach which audiences and help draw that line of um, logic between threats to our resources and future states we're trying to achieve. Where can our education help address those threats and lead us towards our future states? <clears throat> so <clears throat> enough about the process in that uh, evaluation and let me talk a, a little bit about some of the the challenges because um, if you undertake something similar for the protected area or resources you're um, working towards um, I suspect you, some of these challenges you might encounter as well <laughs> so the first bullet evaluating while doing in an ideal world perhaps you would stop everything you would reflect you would evaluate and then you would start again. Well, that's not realistic for an MPA that is already out there. Maybe a new protected area, you could do some form of this kind of evaluation process um, and develop a program, but when you're actually you know, ongoing, it, it can be very challenging to be evaluating and doing. And by the way, we didn't have a new team of people come in to help us with this. Our staff was doing this on top of everything else that they already do, so that was not easy. The process can feel very threatening. Um, so what I described was us you know, presenting to our partners, our peers, uh, information about what we're doing and asking them to potentially give us some pretty harsh criticism. And that can be kind of scary. And if it's a program that you have helped define and put your heart and soul into, which is every program our team works on, they're putting their heart and soul into it, that's scary to ask somebody to tell you, um, am I on target? As I alluded to, it was very time consuming um, and therefore can be challenging to keep people invested in the process. As they said, we didn't, you know, this team didn't come to Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary for a bunch of navel gazing. These are people that want to make a difference. And so process can feel like process and you have to kind of really trust and keep our eye on that there will be a positive outcome as a result of all this effort. <clears throat> Um, the last bullet, what is Gray's Reef? So what do I mean by that and why is that a challenge? <clears throat> So um, some of you may be familiar with the education-based behavior change model. This model suggests that um, in order for people to become stewards, which I think ultimately is what we want for people to become stewards and help us protect these wonderful places in our ocean, in order for that to happen, they have to start on the left end of this slide, which means they have to just get basic information, they have to deepen their understanding is the next step, and then begin to be motivated to take action, ultimately culminating in becoming stewards along with us of these special places. And the truth of the matter is, is that we really would rather live on the far right end of this behavior change model, meaning we want to be, we want to be creating stewards. But the challenge of our process was that we realized that actually we really need to be paying more attention to the left end of this behavior change model. I mentioned at the beginning when I was providing context for Grace Reef, our sanctuary is very poorly known. And so we have a lot of work to do to just get people exposed to Gray's Reef, to try to deepen their understanding and ultimately hopefully get towards stewardship, which is where we'd rather be. But the challenge is we really realize we got to do a lot of work on the uh, disseminate information end of this. So that was a challenge for us because we'd rather be um, doing other things, quite honestly. A few other challenges, a process like this really requires that you are flexible. The participants in the process have very different expectations. They may have different concerns, time frames, et cetera. Another thing that became very apparent to us as we went through this and prepared for it was that we really lacked some program effectiveness metrics. Um, by that I mean when we went, you know, we wanted to present to our working group members information about, say, a workshop that we had been doing for several years. We might have been lacking on, you know, a lot of the basic information that would tell us how effective it is. So we couldn't really present that to allow that to be considered, um, which was a challenge. Um, the working group 
was extraordinarily generous of their time, their energy, their ideas, and generated an enormous um, collection of ideas, of things that we could be doing better in terms of our outreach and education, which was fabulous. Um, they were less inclined to tell us, you shouldn't be doing this or that. We did get some of that, but honestly, naively, I went into the process hoping to get more of that because we perpetually have more that we can do than we have the bandwidth. And so I was really hoping that this would give us more, um, more information about how to limit what, what we're trying to do. But I think in retrospect, it's easier for people to give you new ideas than it is to tell you you shouldn't do. So I realized after the fact that this is really our work to do, is to take all of this good information and figure out what it really means for us in terms of our action plans. And then lastly on the bottom of this slide, it is still not easy to say no. So this process gave us uh, a clearer understanding of what we should do, but it's still challenging. We don't want to not do exciting education and outreach programs. We don't want to say no when someone says, hey, can you come and give this talk to our group? It's hard to say no. It still is. We have a better reason to say no now because we have a clearer focus, which brings me to the next um, slide. And I'm in here wanting to lay out some of the benefits of this process. So this list looks shorter, but they have incredible impact. You know, the focus, focus, focus is really, really huge and very, very helpful for us to be able to um, keep our eye on the prize and know what we need to do to march towards those future states that we're trying to achieve. Um, it also really helps me and us to prioritize what we need to be doing. Um, this, this evaluation and the information received, we received through the process um, really helps us filter the steady stream of new ideas, new opportunities that come to us. Oh, hey, we're having a festival. Can you have a booth? Oh, hey, you know, we, we want to put this you know, new brochure together. Do you want to help us? Um, it gives us a means whereby we can say, you know what, yes, that really is part of our focus. It is part of what we need to be doing. Or you know what, it's really not. So we, we're not going to do that. Um, as a, a benefit of this process for us has been a much more refined messaging. So when we go, exa for example, to an event, we really um, think more clearly about what audience is going to be attending that event. What are the messages we want to carry to them? And then what's the best tool to use? Is it, is it a brochure? Is it um, you know, a tweet? Is it, what is the right way to carry what, what message to what audience? So <clears throat> as a result of this evaluation, we really are changing how we do things and what we do. There are programs and tools that we were using or, or undertaking prior to this evaluation that we are no longer using or doing. Um, and, and that's a difficult decision to have to make, but again, if you have a clear focus on what it is you want to achieve and you, you know, put something under the microscope and you really realize, you know what, that's not going to get us where we need to go, then that's the difficult decision you need to make. It's changed our relationships with partners and stakeholders. Um, I feel like people really have a better sense of, our, of what we're trying to achieve and, it, and I feel like we get a much more positive response from people in terms of doing things with us as a result. I've mentioned this already, but it is perpetually and continually a process to incorporate that input. I mentioned we got a ton of good feedback and trying to stay true to it and decide which is the right piece to incorporate, that's challenging, but it's something we're constantly dedicating ourselves to trying to do. As a result of this evaluation, we really realized we needed a, a formal communications plan. And so we developed one, and it really outlines who our audiences need to be, what the key messages we need to reach them with, and what are the tools. So that was a really fabulous benefit for us, in my view. Um, We've, we've been receiving feedback through numerous um, avenues um, that, we, that we're really making a difference. Um, people make observations directly to us or I hear it third hand, oh, so-and-so told me that, you know, Gray's Reef, you're hearing about Gray's Reef all over the place or a dive shop owner, what, what's going on? What are you guys doing differently? Everyone's calling me and wanting to ask about diving Gray's Reef. So 
to me that's not, I can't prove to you that that's a result of our better focus, but I believe strongly that it is. And then the last bullet, we're really, as I said, more effective, more efficient since our focus is sharper. So that was our first swing at the bat in terms of evaluating our, ref, our um, relevance. But we didn't stop there. Um, we next turned to our resource protection program. Uh, again, our management plan calls on us to do this not just one program, but throughout our efforts. So why resource protection next? Well, um, resource protection is really what we're all about. It's our bread and butter. We are, we are charged with protecting this nationally significant ocean place. Um, so that's the sort of primary reason for focusing the microscope there next. However, another more practical reason was that our very talented um, resource protection coordinator was starting to make a little bit of noise about possibly retiring or going part-time. And I really didn't want to see us do this without that person because she would be key to us doing this effectively. So that was part of the reason too. So um, again, in terms of this program, we had to wrap our arms around what are we evaluating. You may remember I put up a slide that showed the different programs and tools for the education. We did the same sort of, okay, what, are we, what is going to be under the microscope this time? And for us, we decided it would be these six um, tools that we use in the resource protection universe. So permitting, uh, direct resource protection, by that I mean, um, for example, our efforts to go out and remove invasive species or remove marine debris, that's us directly going out and doing something to protect the resources. Um, we also evaluated our enforcement efforts, our coordination efforts with other agencies, regulations, and zoning. Um, one could argue that there are other things that could be in the universe of resource protection that should be evaluated. So for example, we have a Sanctuary Advisory Council. This is a group of individuals that provide for us um, advice and consultation on how we should be doing things. One could argue that that is a resource protection tool, and I would agree with that. But for the purposes of this exercise, we decided to leave that out, use, evaluate that as a part of another process, which will be next. Um, education and outreach, that clearly could be considered a resource protection tool. But obviously, we had just put that under the microscope. So we, we, we left that out for the purposes of focus. So um, how did we go about this? Well, much like the evaluation of our out and ed, we pulled together a working group. And you can see on the slide the different um, representatives that we had involved in this. Again, it was outside experts. Um, um, providing feedback to us. In this case, we used webinars for two of our uh, conversations and then we had an in-person meeting. Um, I mentioned in the first webinar, we uh, laid out the tools and described them and explained their history and how we use them, etc. And then we um, talked with the group about the target resources that we wanted to ask them to help us to focus on. Um, the Target resources that we focused on are habitat, marine mammals and sea turtles, and benthic and pelagic fish. Now, that seems very coarse, and it is. But if you remember at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that Gray's Reef has relatively little use and impact. And so as we thought about the tools that we wanted to evaluate, we thought about their um, their impacts, and we thought, you know what, we probably can um, evaluate these lumped together. In the case of an MPA that has much more complex uses and threats, you may need to be more precise in how you look at these resources. But for us, in our context, we felt like this would work. Once again, we wanted to be clear about what audiences we were trying to reach. And it, for us, the filter for this list, the bullets that you see on the top, the seven audiences, we thought, you know, looking at the tools that we are going to evaluate, so enforcement, permitting, zoning, who does that actually affect? And this was the list. Now there are other people, other audiences that have a role to play in resource protection, but the tools that we are evaluating don't touch them. So for example, on that list in small font on the bottom, you see coastal and inland residents. Clearly, if they are, for example, dumping 
something into the waterway, it's going to wash out and it can affect Gray's Reef. That can affect our, our resources in Gray's Reef. That can be a threat. However, our enforcement doesn't apply to that. Our permits don't apply to that, et cetera. And so we realize, you know, while that is important, that's something that needs to be dealt with with our education and outreach. It's not going to be addressed with our tools that we're evaluating now. So that was the first webinar, was talking about tools, audiences, and threats. The second webinar, and these webinars were meant to provide that sense of context and the background for our working group. So we had to do a little, you know, educating, if you will, of um, these folks that were going to help us evaluate. And so our second webinar focused on asking ourselves or discussing the status and condition of those target resources that we were examining, what was affecting those um, resources, what do we know about the activities, so what extent, what time of year, etc. What are we missing and what would we like to achieve? All of this was meant to set, lay the groundwork for when we would come together and everyone would have a common understanding so that when we came together for a two-day in-person meeting, um, we could all understand the context and then get down to the most important business of examining each of those tools relative to each of those target resources and ask ourselves, are we adequately using those tools given the threats that we know about and the human activities that are occurring. And then prioritize that list of things. So that's a quick and dirty description of that process. Um, perhaps more interesting is sort of what did we learn and what, what were the challenges and, and what were some of the benefits. So for this process, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges was wrangling the participants. And I mentioned we had two webinars and an in-person meeting. And the, um, I really would have preferred to do more in person. But because this is a busy group of people, um, it was almost impossible to get them together. In fact, we had to delay the process several months just to find two days when we could get them together. We would have had to do it in about 2019 if we wanted to do more than that. So as a result, we kind of had to simplify that process a bit. And as I mentioned, we only focused on three target resource areas, and we kind of really went a little bit more, um, less granular than I might have liked to do in, through this evaluation. But still, it was productive. Another challenge we really had was in um, lacking detailed information about threats. So we talked about you know, what, what things might be threatening sea turtles in Gray's Reef, for example. In some places in, in Georgia, it's known that recreational fishermen catch sea turtles on hook and line. But we have no data about whether that happens in Gray's Reef, for example. So we really struggle to understand, is this threat that we know that's possibly affecting, for example, sea turtles in coastal Georgia, is that happening in Gray's Reef too? And if so, should we use one of our tools to try to address that? Once again, this process generated a ton of great ideas of things we could do to make our programs better. That's a good thing. But the challenge is trying to know where to start. Um, again, once again, the group had less to say about what not to do. And you know, I understand that. That's, that's understandable. So this last bullet. The results might conflict with res results from out net evaluation. What am I talking about there? So um, remember that this process focused on a narrower list and a different list of audiences from our outreach and education evaluation. And so it, when you look at different audiences and different activities, you are necessarily going to come up with a different list of things that you should do in outreach and education. Um, to be more effective. And so, for example, if we were to come out, if we were only to look at the outnet needs from a resource protection effort, all we would do was focus on boaters, fishermen, and divers, because those are the people that are in Gray's Reef. However, we don't want to just reach the people that use Gray's Reef. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but I want it to be protected. I want people who are never going to go to Gray's Reef to know about it and want it to be protected. And so our outreach and education efforts have to go broader than just the people that are involved in our um, in activities in Gray's Reef. So the challenge for us was to know how to balance the feedback that we got through this process 
with the feedback we got through the OutNet evaluation. I hope that makes some sense. Um, so that was the challenges in a nutshell. There were a lot of benefits to doing this um, for us as well. Um, this was the second time we'd gone through an evaluation and therefore it was smoother and easier, I would argue. Um, it was a good time for us to do it. As I mentioned, we had a new management plan and we didn't have a big resource protection emergency that was um, drawing all of our attention. So, you know, we didn't have a bleaching effect or, you know, permit requests for desalination in our sanctuary or something like that. So things are relatively smooth, relatively calm, so we could take some of our bandwidth and do this. And th by this I mean, you know, undertake this collaborative effort to look at our activities and build new threat-based action plans. Again, once again, this is about trying to get us to our future states and making sure that the, the actions that we're taking are really addressing the threats and will help us move in that direction. Um, another benefit was just the fact that, you know, through this process we didn't hear from this working group that, gosh, you really need to kind of start over and whole cloth recreate your resource protection efforts. There was a lot of validation, you know, your research area is, is, is good to have, you, it's good that you ban spear fishing and anchoring, et cetera. So there was a good bit of validation, which is not a bad thing to hear. So as a result of this process, um, you know, we got a lot of recommendations that honestly are beyond our bandwidth. By that I mean um, we just don't have the capacity, for example, to develop a new app. So that was something that came out of this, like wouldn't it be great to have an app that people that are out in Gray's Reef can make observations and we can begin to collect some data to fill those information gaps that I mentioned that were a challenge for this process. Well, yes, that would be great, but we don't have anybody on staff who has that capacity or has the bandwidth to, to learn how to do it. And so we felt like, boy, maybe that's something that could be approached regionally because Gray's Reef is not the only part of the southeast coast that could benefit from better sighting information, for example. Um, what if we did that regionally or nationally? So we're going to try to see, you know, can we develop some interest with partners to, to take on some of these things. Um, I already talked about how outreach and education kind of play a role here, um, and that was definitely um, emphasized throughout this process, and uh, a lot of times we came up against, well, here's a threat, here's an activity, but is it's not really enforcement that's going to make this better. What we really need is to make people aware that, for example, they're not supposed to take undersized fish that they catch and use that as bait, that that actually is illegal, but apparently there are a fair number of people in our waters who, when they catch an undersized fish, think, well, heck, I'll just use it as bait, and there you go. So there's an, that's not something that, you know, a permit or a zone is going to change. That's something that we have to get out and, and make people aware that this is um, something they need to do differently. Um, we also identified a long list of research needs and information gaps from that, which is, which is good. It will help our science coordinator um, be more targeted and focused in what we plan moving forward. And so the last bullet on this slide, um, it was helpful. We had our science coordinator, our OutNED staff attend this in-person conversation as observers. They weren't necessarily part of the conversation, but they were taking notes on what aspects of what was being discussed might inform their program area, and that was really beneficial. So why did we do all this? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, this is a group of people that want to have their efforts result in effective management of Gray's Reef. And so we really wanted to have a careful examination of what is the return on the investment that we are making in our own time, in our, in our resources, what is that getting us? Where are we now? Where are we going? And what do we need to get there moving forward? Um, it, this whole process, I believe, has brought us together more as a team 
to have this group come together and articulate together and own together what it is we're trying, those future states that we're, we're striving towards, um, makes us much more focused and stronger. Um, as you can see from these pictures, it's a group that's not afraid to get up and whiteboard and put stickies all over the place, as long as we got a little fuel, you know, some pizza and some soda. Um, this, these folks don't want to just do, they want to do the best. So that's, that's what we were undertaking. Because we consider it a privilege to be responsible for one of the national treasures in our ocean, Gray's Reef. And we want to be accountable to the people that give us that privilege, and, um, and this process has really helped us to do that. So that's our story. Um, I wonder if you're thinking, should I do this, or should we do this in what, what I'm involved in? And I would guess that there might be a few folks out there that are thinking, we don't have time to do something like this, and I can understand that completely. Um, but I also believe that probably most of you um, have more things that you want to do than you can do. No matter what you're doing, no matter what kind of work you do, most people I know, time is always an issue. Invest a little bit, and it will allow you to know what you should be spending time on. That certainly was true for us. As far as process, um, you know, I wish that I could say, well, here's the formula for an evaluation on how to do this. Um, but as you, I hope, gathered from my remarks so far, this was something that we had to kind of design and make some, some judgment calls along the way. So there's no one set of answers on how to do it. But that's okay, because the process itself was very valuable for us. It really was helpful for us to reflect and understand. And, and we don't have perfect final products. We're still kind of evolving. And so it's not about the final product. It's about that process. And speaking of process, you know, I've said many times, we're a small sanctuary, we're a small staff. So sometimes I think people are mistaken in thinking that it's only the heavily resourced MPAs or you know groups that can afford to do this. But this kind of uh, consideration can be done at a different scale. So it can be done with a smaller group of people um, and limited resources. I mentioned we had no new staff, we had no new money to do this. Um, it was on top of everything else we were already doing. Um, and then um, I think you know, some people might be thinking, you know, we've already been doing our whatever program for a long time. We don't need to examine our relevance. Um, but I would, I would offer that maybe it's time to consider that things change. There are new issues that come up, new opportunities. So some kind of reflection on your program might really help you to respond to those changes and opportunities. Others may be thinking, ah, oh, well, we don't have any problems or crises. Our, our program is just fine. Well, neither did we. We were, you know, I told you, we have a you know, relatively well-protected, low-use MPA. And, and so we were fine. But, but fine is one thing. How about being better? And that's what we were striving toward. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, for me, as a superintendent and manager of a, a, a protected area, this truly helps me with daily decision making. I, in, in my position, there are constant decisions to be made relative to resources, time, money, you know, how should we use the boat, regular decisions that have to be made. And I think about the, imp the information that we, we receive through this process every time I'm making those decisions. So it really does help contribute to those um, decisions. So. With that, I will stop and see if there are any questions. Sarah, thank you so much. This was fabulous. Um, so I, before we get started on, on outside questions, I just want to remind everyone how to ask the questions. So again, there's a question field in the user interface. Just type your questions in there, and I will relay them to Sarah. Um, so we have one question right now. Um, and that's, can you give us an example of something that changed as a result of this evaluation and what difference that made for your program? Yes. So um, I mentioned after the education evaluation that we stopped doing some programs and stopped using some tools. So for example, we had um, 
been producing a newsletter. And um, after discussion with the working group, we realized that, you know, um, newsletters are not really how people are getting their information as much. I'm not saying that they're not valuable. I'm just saying if you, if you for us, given the suite of things we can do, we reflected that perhaps that is not going to get us the most return on investment. It takes us a lot of time to generate it, to develop it. Um, maybe we should be moving more towards social media and electronic communications instead of a printed newsletter. So that's an example of a tool that we were no longer going to use. An example of a program that we um, we decided to put a pause on was a program that we were undertaking to do phytoplankton monitoring. And this was a very important program. People were very dedicated to it. But the reason we transitioned away from that was because there's a research partner right on the campus where our offices are that was doing something similar. And so for us it was, well, should we really dedicate time and effort? Um, it's not that big of a program. And someone else can, the volunteers that were working with us on that program could be absorbed into our partners program and their commitment still remains and has an outlet, but the ed energy and time that we had been spending doing that could be rededicated to something else. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, another question. Once you've completed your evaluation of each of your program areas, how will you create some integration between your program areas so they complement each other and are not stovepiped? Right. That's a great question. And that's something we're actively working on right now because our outreach and education program evaluation was completed um, in last summer, not this summer, but the summer before. And then our resource protection program evaluation, the, the external part of that, we just completed in uh, early September. And so we are right now pulling together a report from that working group, uh, the resource protection evaluation, and we've got that long list of outreach and education ideas that were generated from that. And so we are now starting to look at them side by side. Um, so it's something we're actively doing. I wish I could say, and you know, here's the final product, but it's an ongoing integration that has to happen. And it's not easy. Like I said, I, I mentioned, you know, we still have to say no. And that's a hard thing to do for a group of people that are energetic, passionate, committed, and want to keep going. Um, but yet, it's, it is difficult to pull this all together and, and, and implement it. So I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but it's the one I got. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Sure. Um, and just sort of a, uh, we don't need other questions from others, so if you do have any questions, send them in. But um, I just wanted to ask you what's next. Like, are there other evaluations you want to do? Is it all about implementation now? Great question. Yeah, so um, we are, because we are, as I just described, still trying to integrate those two evaluations and because um, we had been sort of plugging along with responding to the first evaluation and then we did the second one and as I mentioned there was some like, okay, how do we balance those? That's what we're living in right now. So I want to spend some time getting ourselves on track and focused that in a reflection of what we learned through these processes. So we're going to take a pause for a little while on jumping into the next evaluation, but I don't mean years, I mean months. And, and then once we kind of get ourselves on track with these two evaluations that we've completed, the next conversation that I want to have is about our resource, excuse me, our, our management, so how we do business. So look at our, um, look at our Sanctuary Advisory Council. I mentioned we could have theoretically included that in our resource protection, but we're going to do that next. Look at how we um, work together as a team, how we coordinate with other agencies. Some of that sort of, you know, how we do business evaluation is what we're going to take on next. And so, honestly, you know, the education and outreach put the microscope on our out and ed team. The resource protection put the microscope on our resource protection coordinator and her activities. This next one is going to put the microscope on what I own, you know, the, the, the managing of this um, program. So that one should be interesting. 
Okay, yeah, it's, it's, yeah it gets personal. Um, <laughs> let's see, and there was sort of a, a question related to that. Uh, have these evaluations been used to determine the makeup of your staff based on your program priorities? Um, not so much because um, the, we haven't had vacancies to fill in these program areas um, to, in response. In other words, I haven't had a vacancy that I can say, okay, now we learned this, so let's fill this position. We just haven't had that, um, that opportunity. But they would. Um, if, you know, if I were going to be filling a slot, I definitely, most certainly, would be thinking about what are the skill sets that our evaluation tells us that we need based on, you know, we need to be doing more of this. I mean, maybe it would tell me, oh, I want to bring somebody in who knows how to make apps. You know, I'm not saying that's what it is, but that's an example from, um, you know, I mentioned that we learned that we might need to develop some apps. Well, nobody on staff right now knows how to do that, but might that be something we consider if we're hiring someone in the future? Could be. Could be. Okay, thank you. And we have two more questions that have come in. Uh, one is, are there FACA considerations regarding the working groups? And uh, if you're able, I believe FACA is Federal Advisory Committee Act, um, if you're able to give an overview of what FACA considerations there might be. Um, well, probably about as much as I can say about that was that these were um, working groups of our Sanctuary Advisory Council, and so they fell under our Sanctuary Advisory Council order of business. Um, and so uh, in each of these working groups um, had members of our Sanctuary Advisory Council, and in fact it was chaired by our Sanctuary Advisory Council. So. Um, I'm not the expert on FACA, but I understand that our Sanctuary Advisory Council activities are, are you know, part of that. I don't know if you have a, more uh, knowledge than I about that. I do not. Um, if okay. anyone does, you know, if you let me know. I, I, know, I know my resource protection person does, and I think she was <laughs> on here, but I don't know how to get her. Oh, who is it? Becky Shortland. Sorry, Becky. Put you on the spot. Yeah, let's see if she's <laughs> uh, Okay. She might be off. Right? Yeah, there she is. Hi, Becky. Are you able to talk? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yep. we can hear you. Okay, well, it's a simple answer. Our Sanctuary Advisory Council is not subject to FACA. Okay. There you All go. Right. So that answers the question. Thank you so much, Becky. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. <Yeah. laughs> Um, let's see. Moving on to the next question. Um, oh, and I would say there was, there was a request for the presentation. I did want to let everyone know that the, the a PowerPoint version of the presentation and a recording will be posted on openchannels.org um, a w little bit after the webinar. So if you want to get a link to those, uh, you can shoot me an email. That's uh, EBM, sorry, EBM tools at natureserve.org. It's the same address your email about the webinar came from. If you shoot me an email, I can uh, hook you up with a link to those. Um, okay, how frequently do you envision reconducting each evaluation? For instance, once every five years or more frequently? More, less uh, frequently. Um, huh, good question. Um, I don't know that there's a formula. Um, I think that um, we're going to get through this first round of them. Um, after our uh, management, um, I think we may do something with our research efforts. Um, and that will probably, from the start of the first evaluation till that's done, uh, if I had to guess, I'd say it would probably be on the order of four years between the start of the first one to the last one. Um, and so, it might be time to kind of reinvest and, and sort of start over at that point, but I think I would probably um, let the circumstances of the program area um, inform that. In other words, um, is there something changing um, in our community that would suggest that, yep, we've moved through that first step of the behavior change model, for example, we're really ready to graduate to, you know, further along. And so then we don't need to be living um, in the just jumping up and down and saying Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary exists, right? So we can change our programs and begin to focus more on how we're, you know, increasing people's knowledge. Just not, hey, we, we are out there, but 
learning more about it, which would change our programs. So that would be, um, it wouldn't be necessarily on X time scale we're going to do these evaluations. Instead, it would be driven by have circumstances changed enough that suggest that maybe we should be doing things differently moving forward. In the case of the resource protection, if there are new threats, um, if something changes about the landscape of our resource protection universe, then yep, um, we, better, we better reflect again. So <clears throat> that's my answer. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and that will wrap up now. But thank you so much for being on. This is a great presentation. We had uh, great questions and answers at the end. So, and we really appreciate everyone being here. So all I'd say at the end is uh, wish everyone a, a, a good rest of their week and next and uh, happy holidays to everyone. And uh, thank you again, Sarah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>